Dear students, dear guests, welcome to the fifth lecture of our joint seminar on Global Governance in the Role of Cities. This course is a partnership between the Global Awareness Education at the University of Tübingen in Germany and the Federal University of ABC in Brazil. In this course, we will address various perspectives on the topic, such as challenges faced by big cities, sustainable cities, migration and health issues. We'll have guests from different countries and contexts to contribute with lectures, which will be interspersed with more practical classes in which students will do case studies on Latin American, African, and Asian big cities. In both universities, the course is offered to students of different disciplines, in Tübingen as part of the transdisciplinary course program and at the Federal University of ABC as a free extension course. The course organizers are Professor Gilberto Rodriguez, Federal University of ABC, and me, Dr. Glaucia Perez da Silva, University of Tübingen. Today, we are very proud to have uh, the lecture on global migration flows and the reconfiguration of cities with Professor Mariana Machan from Universidad de las Américas Puebla, Mexico. She holds a chair in international relations at the Universidad de las Américas where she directs the Canadian Studies Program. She was promoted to the highest level of the National System of Researchers in January 2013. In addition to her academic activities in Mexico, she has worked at or been affiliated with universities in Canada, the US, the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. She has published widely about such themes as globalization, gender, migration, development, resistances, and transnational movements. Her current research interests focus on the nexus between gender, migration, and development, as well as subaltern knowledge and borders. So we are very happy to have you here, Marianne. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Glaucia. I'm very happy to, to be here and uh, to share some of my ideas and, uh, and research on the topic of cities and, and migration. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so welcome uh, everyone, um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, <laughs> on what continent you're currently uh, are, are staying. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about, well, the issue of, of my, migration in the context of cities. Um, and I'm going to try to make some uh, connections with previous uh, lectures, in particular, um, the lecture by uh, Professor Saskia Sassen. And, and then also I will bring in some examples from, uh, from my own research on, on Mexican cities in particular. So I hope um, this is, if, if there's a problem in, in, uh, in the, the way you can see the presentation, please let me know. But basically the organization of the, um, the lecture is as follows. First, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> how cities and migrants can be approached, how that relationship can be approached. I won't go into detail. Um, in one of the readings that um, I, I gave for you to read precisely deals with this, with some of the, the let's, let's put it this way, with some of the, the a theoretical analytical frameworks, then I will introduce very briefly some key concepts, because if I understand correctly, the students will also do a presentation, so I won't uh, sort of try to, to uh, get in their way in this respect. And the examples that I want to talk about are precisely from my research on Mexico, and then I will um, basically deal in a very brief way what are some of the implications for governance, in particular the governance of migration in the context of cities. But that is really at the end and is more raising questions and issues than uh, giving answers because I don't think we're at that stage yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> As the, the, the chapter that I assigned to you, oh, sorry, it's going to, a little bit too fast. Um, yeah, sorry. As the, um, the chapter that I assigned to you um, uh, sort of explains is there are different ways of looking at the relationship between cities and, and migration and migrants. And 
um, basically in the past, what we've seen is that um, most of the times there's a, a, a huge emphasis, especially from um, the authorities in cities um, and, 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 and the public uh, officials, that, that migrants should adapt and, and integrate themselves. They should adapt them to that new situation and, and they should integrate or assim even assimilate. That's the sort of the general discourse. But that, that changed um, more recently. And in particular, it changed uh, in sort of uh, 2015, maybe just a little bit before that, 2016. Um, and it changed because, um, at least at the international or global level, if you like, um, there was suddenly a lot more emphasis on the relationship between cities and migrants. On the one hand, um, the International Organization for Migration, uh, in its 2015 World Migration Report, really put the role of cities in the governance of migrants and migration on the map, on the political and public policy map. A year later, uh, with UN Habitat uh, 3, which took place actually in Latin America, in Quito, Ecuador, um, they introduced the new urban agenda. Now, um, the new urban agenda is a huge document. It's a sort of a declaration of what should be done um, in terms of uh, urban problems and, and, and urban living, if you like. But um, in, in relation to migration, um, I think there are two very important elements that the new urban agenda raised. One is um, that there should be a focus on the contributions of migrants to cities. What, what can they contribute? What have they contributed to cities? And how those cities shape the lives and practices and experiences of migrants. So it's a sort of an understanding that there is a there, there is a, a, a relationship that goes both ways between cities and migrants. And the other thing which is very dominant in the in the document on the newer of, of the new urban agenda is the right to the city. And so that implies also that migrants have a right to the city, you know, that they should not be uh, marginalized, that they should not be uh, completely ignored. They also have a right to live in these spaces. So I think that is very important from a global governance perspective. And especially when you look at, uh, you know, the different actors um, that are involved in global governance and in this particular uh, context to the global governance of, of migrants and migration. Okay, as we know, um, <clears throat> uh, or as you should know, probably know by now, uh, Saskia Sassen has been very important in framing debates on cities and, and, and globalization in particular, and to a secondary extent, global governance, because I would argue that her work is much more in terms of global political economy than really global governance. So she's much more interested in, in the process, in the political economic processes that um, have uh, restructured, configured, reconfigured, cities and what is the role of cities in all of this well um, she has uh, an incredible uh, amount of, of of an incredible bibliography on the role of cities in the world economy and just using one of her um, of, of her books is sort of that provides an overview of cities in a world economy the first edition was in 1994 the fourth edition is in 2012. I don't think there is a newer edition, but uh, at any rate, what she mentions is really that process of globalization, right, is, um, has, has really um, en engendered uh, a territorial dispersal of economic activities, right? That is one of the main issues here. And Therefore, we also need to figure out um, what actors or entities can then 
uh, centralize certain kinds of functions and operations. And that is where her argument of global cities comes in, right? Because she says, okay, we have this huge geographical uh, dispersed economic act, uh, range of economic activities. And, uh, and we also need to control and manage those activities. That is where these global cities come in, in particular in the servicing and financing of international trade, international investment, and for instance, the operations of headquarters of, 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 of uh, enterprises, transnational corporations, the headquarters uh, that like to be clustered. They, they like to be in cities um, that have already services, that have already headquarters from all these other uh, companies, et cetera, et cetera, because that enables them to uh, operate more smoothly. So for Sassen, uh, global cities are nodes in the world economy, right? And so, um, but, but she goes beyond that. She's not just talking the, uh, about them as, you know, these nodes, but she's also talking about um, the effects of that. In particular, the, the inequalities that, has been, that have been generated um, by the process of globalization, but also that concentration of these um, certain kinds of, of economic activities in certain places, these global cities, right? And so what she's saying is what we see is, is a sort of what she calls the new geography of centrality and marginality, right? So we have different or multiple economies, um, work cultures, and cities also then become interesting and interested in terms of cultural politics, which is sometimes where also migrants and, uh, and, and ethnic groups come in because they will give that sort of multicultural perspective to a global city, right? Um, <clears throat> But what is also true, and, and Sassen actually mentions this almost from the beginning, is that these cities become sort of disconnected from what she calls their hinterlands. So they're, they're, they, come, they become disembedded from the national economies. And they, they have more and more uh, connectivity with other global cities in particular, but then also with uh, you know, cities at different tiers of in, in the global economy. So, um, so that, that sort of creates, the, uh, creates spaces, these economic spaces and nodes that, that start to almost live their own lives, right? And, and, and the connectivities are much more amongst these cities than with other uh, types of uh, economic environments. Now, if we then turn, and, and what Sassen already in her earlier work mentioned, um, what, what is then very important is to also look at what is what are the effects for basically the labor market, but also for people, right? Migrants in particular. And what she notices is there, that global cities in general attract two kinds of migrants the very high level professionals um, that are being recruited by those transnational corporations, by those service sectors, uh, dealing with finance, dealing with insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, and advertising for instance. Um, but on the other hand, there is an increasing informalization um, in these cities as well. So you will find in New York, you know, you will find the high the Wall Street and the very high level professionals, but you will also find uh, what I will come back to later on um, is are the migrant communities in New York who are usually undocumented um, and who do also service work, but mostly in restaurants in hotels as cleaners, as uh, cleaning dishes, um, 
as uh, of working in the offices, this this is one of the well, the big dramas of the, the, basically the attack on the Twin Towers of Wall Street in 2001 was that a lot of people, cleaners and, and staff were working there uh, and were undocumented. So we really don't know how many of, the, of people actually uh, died in, in those attacks, uh, especially from these migrant communities. So that is something that is still sort of in, invisibilized, I would argue, right? So we have those two things in, in these global cities. Now, um, as your, your, uh, the, the chapter that I assigned um, also so indicates is obviously there are not that many global cities, right? Uh, Sussan herself focused on London, New York, and Tokyo. Um, and maybe we can think of a couple of more cities, but, but there are a lot of cities around the world that are involved in globalization, if you like, and, and fulfill certain roles, but they don't have the, the specific, uh, you know, characteristics of a global city. So these global cities, in fact, to some extent are quite unusual. They're, they're, I wouldn't say the exception, but they're, they're the top of the iceberg. And there are a lot of other cities, uh, middle-sized, um, and, and the, the, the authors, and if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I think it's Saglai, no, was it Sag sorry, Chala. That's, I think, how you have to pronounce it, but I'm still not 100% sure. And Gleek Schiele. When they were then when they're talking about uh, migrants and city making, right? Because what they're saying is we're, we're looking at middle-sized or what they call disempowered cities. I wouldn't call them all disempowered cities, but okay, um, just to to stick with their arguments. So this is a, is a different sighting, if you like, on city making um, and migrants, right? And on the on, on how cities perform their role in the global economy but uh, from a different perspective, from basically these middle-sized uh, cities that are also engaged in global flows, but in a very different way. So without going into too much um, detail, um, basically what they're trying to introduce, and they, they, they do use some of, of Sassen's ideas, but they are um, looking at what they call a global multiscalar analytical framework. Uh, and what they're basically saying is there are lots of inequalities uh, generated through the regeneration and through the uh, engagements with global flows and trying to be competitive, right, as a city, because that's the new you know, neoliberal name of the game. And so the, the, there is, you see in, increasing inequalities, precarity and displacement within these uh, middle-sized or, or disempowered cities, right? But the interesting thing is what they're, they're also arguing, and I, I would like, you know, that we can have a conversation about that or a discussion if you like, is they're really questioning what they call, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, methodological nationalism, the differentiation between migrant and non-migrant populations. They say what we really should do is we should look at commonalities amongst these populations and where they connect. What are those common spaces? And how are they dealing with that, right? Instead of saying, okay, um, these are the, the, the ethnic minorities and these are the, the local uh, you know, uh, populations and they don't get along and the ethnic minorities, they have to adjust, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's an interesting argument. And so basically what um, they're arguing is that we have to focus on the contributions of migrants um, to urban regeneration projects. And, um, and we should not always enter that, that 
discourse that has been going on for a long, long time, both at the local, but also at the national level, is that migrants need to integrate or assimilate. There, there are lots of different uh, terms for that. <clears throat> but what is, what is important, according to these, um, to, to these two authors, is that we, that we really should rethink that relationship between cities and migrants and non-migrants, in other words, people, right? Or human beings. <clears throat> so um, they, they then come with a couple of um, key concepts. Um, one of them, and this picture, by the way, is from Amsterdam and, and refers to the issue of uh, gentrification, right? So shithouse to penthouse is very clear that uh, the people who are putting it are not so happy with it. So basically what they're saying is, okay, what we've seen since at least the 1990s is a neoliberal restructuring of urban spaces. And, and it takes place or of the form of two in, in two ways. In many instances, you see a privatization of public land, right? So um, it, it, you create different kinds of, of spaces uh, and you basically control access through privatization. And what you see is gentrification. Uh, and I'm assuming that you've already dealt with the issue of gentrification in, in one of your of the previous uh, classes. Um, and this is very clearly uh, going on in, in many, many cities in, in the global north and global south, right? Um, so old working class neighborhoods uh, are being gentrified they're, they're, um, through, through urban development or redevelopment projects and local populations, uh, low income populations have to move out because uh, their houses have been bought up, et cetera, et cetera. So, and what um, Chala, Chagala and, uh, and Nina Glickschiller are trying to say, I'm trying to pronounce correctly, but it's not an easy uh, uh, name to, to pronounce. What they're really looking at is who is being displaced right and and where to you know what what are the areas that people are displaced to and who are being in place so who you know um benefit for instance from the gentrification and where does this gentrification uh, take place right um and so so this is what for them is reveals the the, the spatial logic of these, these restructuring projects, the scalars uh, dimension, but also um, the power dimensions of that, right? And as soon as you, for political scientists, it's, it's always the question, you know, who has the power? Um, and and the, the, the phrase that we always learn in the beginning is who, who gets what, when, and how, right? And that is all about power, okay. So, um, so these are the key concepts, and I know that they're being discussed in the in the article. So I'm not going to go into them too much because uh, hopefully the students will also talk a little bit more about that. Okay, um, but as you know, as um, Glaucia already mentioned, um, I I live in Mexico. Um, you know, although I'm going back and forth between the Netherlands and Mexico. But I'm very interested in issues from the global south. And so uh, a lot of what has been written on global cities uh, and also in terms of this multi-scalar uh, um, regeneration and so on um, that, that for middle-sized um, cities, the question is, what is going on in the global south? Because if you really look at the global map, many of the major mega, mega, mega cities are in the global south, right? And the question then is, are they following the same logics? Because none of those cities is considered a global city. 
but they they are enormous, right? Uh, Mexico City is uh, if you if you take all the areas around it, more than twenty million people, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm not sure how big Sao Paulo is, but undoubtedly also <laughs> very very uh, large. So I think there's something that we need to understand what is going on, especially as also uh, the United Nations, the UN Habitat has informed us that more than 50% of the world population lives in cities, right? So we cannot ignore them and we cannot just stick with our little cities, quote unquote, in the global north, right? So um, <clears throat> examples from the global south. Well, um, since I'm living in Mexico, um, we had a, a research project on uh, a couple of Mexican cities, borrowing from quite a few authors, but also challenging some of the theoretical underpinnings of what is going on and how uh, cities in the global south are being framed, right? So um, the cities are Tijuana, Puebla, where um, I'm living, and Monterrey. Okay. Um, and just before I start with going into those cities and, and talk a little bit about the, um, <clears throat> about the examples, I think there are two things that are very important to understand um, what is you know, or to at least as a sort of a toolbox for understanding some of the changes and differences in, uh, in terms of cities in the global south. And the first uh, theoretical approach that I think is very important and, and is being, among others, uh, produced or, or suggested by, by Anyanya Roy is the notion of worlding cities. So, She's not talking about uh, global cities. No, she's talking about worlding cities. And what she's saying is that the insertion of cities from the global south into the global political economy does not necessarily reflect the experiences from a transnational elite, like what we see, for instance, in global cities, uh, um, on, the, on the ones that, uh, that Sassen has been talking about but involves what she calls a worlding or you know, globalization, if you like, uh, from below through circuits of migration, resource evacuation. So resource extraction is very important in that context and commodity exchange. So not so much the financial services or uh, advertisement, but also commodity exchange is very important in these cities. And obviously within the literature of new extractivism, um, that makes, makes perfect sense. The other um, elements, and, and, and this is really from two authors who've done a lot of work in Mexico, Mexican cities in particular, um, but uh, in relation to migration. Um, uh, Bess Federico Becerer and Daniela Oliver, um, what they're doing, and, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find anything by them in English, so I do, couldn't assign it. Um, they introduced the notion of transnational cities. And what they're saying is that cities are not anymore necessarily contiguous, right? Um, they are what they call a conglomerate of transnational social spaces um, <clears throat> That, that subjects construct between urban poles. And the three images that I put here on the slide are precisely that. Because migrants from Puebla who go to New York, because that's one of their primary destinations, New York and New Jersey, uh, that, that community has now been called Puebla York instead of New York. Okay, we even have like an organization called PueblaYork.org, right? Oh, and then you get these murals in New York with the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is the patron saint of, of Mexico, but also uh, very much tied to, to, um, to Puebla. And then I love New York pizza. You would think, okay, fine, New York, right? No, but that is a pizzeria somewhere in a very small town 
in Puebla, in the state of Puebla, right? So New York pizza in Puebla, right? <laughs> because a lot of uh, migrants from Puebla work in restaurants and, there's, and so also in pizzerias and they come back and they, may, they have their own pizzerias and their New York pizza, right? So just to show what, what Becerer and Oliver uh, consider transnational cities, right? And so obviously New York and Puebla are not connected, but they, they create a certain kind of transnational circuit or space that can be considered a transnational city. Okay, the three cities, I'm, I'm seeing that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a bit faster. Um, the three cities that we looked at are, are here, Puebla, Monterrey, and Ensenada. So uh, one is a border town, Tijuana, one is uh, in the northern part of Mexico City, and one is in the central part of Mexico. Um, <clears throat> and so basically um, what these three cities have in common, they're sort of um, in the top 10 of the cities in Mexico, but they're not the largest city because Mexico City is again, the sort of something by in and of itself, right? So um, they're in the, in the top 10. And, and basically um, they have tried to become more and more competitive uh, through attracting foreign direct investment. In the case of, um, of, of Puebla and Monterrey, it has been in part through the automotive industry. And in the case of Tijuana and Puebla, through the maquiladora industry, the export processing zones, right? In particular, Tijuana, but Puebla also has a huge uh, maquila sector, right? So they're the ways in which they've inserted themselves into this competitiveness game has been very, uh, very different. Um, but what you see then on a local basis is that they, um, there, there is a certain kind of territorial expansion through industrial parks and so on um, in order to accommodate these industries to allow factories to be built and so on at the expense of communal uh, lands that were uh, still in, in the hands of, of local uh, farmers. And so this is one of those um, <clears throat> you know, dispossessions or accumulation uh, through dispossession that also um, uh, Sassen is talking about, right? What it also is, has done is that those three towns have become increasingly dependent on foreign direct investment, right? For, for their, their growth, for their competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, <clears throat> In, in the case of Puebla, um, they, they rely very much on the German economy because it's the largest uh, Volkswagen factory outside of Germany. And uh, now there's also a, a, an Audi factory. And in the case of uh, Monterrey, it's more uh, uh, on South Korea. <clears throat> okay, so what is happening in these towns uh, in terms of migration? Well, it would be too much to, uh, to talk about all the details, but um, what, and here we borrow a little bit from assemblage theory, what we see is the emergence of what uh, sometimes is called in the literature, messy networks, right? In, in terms of a social spatial articulation of these metropolitan areas through the migrant groups. So how are they constructing or reconstructing um, these cities. Well, here we have Puebla. And Puebla, um, as I already uh, mentioned, has uh, a very strong tie, not just with Germany, but also with, uh, with New York. So on the, on the right-hand top, you have Puebla Mexican food, clearly uh, it's the 47th uh, First Avenue. So there you go, it's, it's right there in, in, uh, in New York. But what you also see is for instance, um, there's a whole construction of, um, of, of, of uh, elements, if you like, uh, in Puebla that all refer to Germany and have to do with Germany ranging from the uh, Colegio Humboldt, the school, 
obviously the uh, the companies, uh, the Volkswagen and Audi, but also restaurants, right? We have uh, here uh, a restaurant, we have a, a language school, supermarkets that sell sauerkraut, um, uh, <laughs> animal protection organizations that are run by Germans, right? All these things. It's, it's very interesting. And when I talked to the consul, the, the honorary consul, the German honorary consul in, 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 in Puebla, he said, no, no, Germans don't organize themselves. But, but through their presence, uh, where they live, what they do, obviously they, they, they construct part of, of Puebla, right? They give us a certain kind of uh, dimension. But what is so interesting is that the city um, and the state of Puebla, they, they don't have any engagements through the, a sort of a migration discourse with Germans. When they talk about migrants, they talk about poblano migrants abroad in New York. So they talk about Puebla York, or they talk about uh, returning migrants that may have been deported or returned voluntarily. Right. So, um, and, and, and that is what you see here at the bottom. Acuerdo para la implementación del protocol. Atención a dreamers. So this is for um, attention to the, the dreamers the, the, from, from uh, the United States, the, the you know, the, the migrant uh, children who came very early and get, got the status of being a dreamer. Um, and, and the, the, Poblano migrants uh, who have returned. No mention, no connection whatsoever uh, with the Germans. Because in the local language, because I even asked people, Germans are seen as expats, not as migrants. Right? So they make a differentiation, a discursive differentiation between expats and migrants. And so migrants, there is immediately a class connotation, right? Uh, you're, you're poor, you're a working class, et cetera, et cetera. If you're an expat, you're linked to, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of highly skilled, highly specialized uh, types of work. So I find that very, very interesting. Okay, that is um, uh, Puebla. Let me see how I'm doing with time. Um, Okay, um, Tijuana um, is the border city. And what happened in 2016 was that suddenly uh, very large groups of, um, of people from Haiti were coming, but they weren't coming directly from Haiti. They were coming uh, from Brazil and from Chile. They were in Brazil, maybe Glaucia know, <laughs> knows more about this than I do. They were in Brazil as construction workers for the, the, the world uh, uh, soccer or uh, football championships and, and helped to construct the stadiums and then later the Olympic games. But then there was no work anymore and then they had to leave Brazil. So some of them went first to, to Chile. Uh, the economy was a little bit better and others almost immediately went on and decided that they wanted to go to the United States. But they went basically overland from Brazil through Central, Mex uh, so to Central America, the southern town of the southern or the, the, the border town between um, Guatemala and Mexico, uh, Tapachula. And, local uh, migration officials didn't really know what to do. So they would get a little piece of paper that said, in 20 days, you have to leave the country. And so then they would take a bus from the Southern part of Mexico to the Northern town of Tijuana. And they would try to cross the border and ask for a temporary protected status in the United States which the United States had been giving to people from Haiti um, in case they had been suffering from uh, an earthquake, right? Uh, but that was already in 2010, 2011. 
So they were coming in 2016, which is, and, and they had been living in, in Brazil. So, so kind of interesting, but okay. What happened that the American officials, the, they came to the conclusion that there were suddenly a lot of people asking for temporary protected status. So what they were doing is they were reducing the amount of people who could um, cross the border and have an interview with them. And so they got all stuck in Tijuana. I mean, I was there, I took some of those pictures. I was there, it was really incredible. People were, uh, they were just stuck, literally stuck there. They couldn't go anywhere. Um, the migrant shelters were overflown. And, and so um, they, and they could, you know, and so basically what um, people tried to do was to accommodate themselves uh, and, and uh, accommodate the Haitians in Tijuana and trying to get them across the border and also try to get them to some of the other northern uh, border towns. Um, but what then also occurred as a result was the creation of what they called Little Haiti. So a little small, you know, neighborhood, a few houses where, where people from Haiti were congregating. Obviously, Tijuana being at the border, there were all these uh, transnational organizations, civil society organizations were trying to, to help. So that was another kind of, you know, um, issue that, that has, um, has emerged in that, that particular context. So uh, there was, it, it was very interconnected cross border or transnational, but at the same time, initially there was no problem and people were accommodating, but then xenophobia also started and people started to reject uh, the Haitians and uh, people started to say, well, you have to attend first returning Mexican migrants instead of the Haitians. So a lot of pressure on the local, um, local authorities who also said, you know, in Mexico City, we're so far away, they don't even know what we're uh, doing and, and they, they couldn't care less. So it has been a very tense situation. <clears throat> um, the last case is that of Monterrey. And Monterrey is uh, a sort of the, the, the manufacturing center is very, very, um, uh, strong as sort of a powerhouse within Mexico in terms of its, its economy. But at the same time, um, it is quite, when we did our research, we were just astounded because um, the local um, government office that was dealing with migration issues wasn't dealing with people from Monterrey abroad and or from Nueva Leon, which is the state. No, they were saying, no, 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 we're dealing with migrants, but indigenous migrants from Mexico. So basically they, they, they constructed indigenous people who are Mexican, obviously, but they constructed them as migrants, as aliens, if you like, as, as not belonging, right? What did happen though, was that many of those um, indigenous people did, you know, they were attracted to the economic opportunities, if you like. And so they, they started to, to um, create their own neighborhoods, basically downtown, which is also one of those areas that is not uh, very well developed, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so what they're trying to do is, by being there, they, they really started to mobilize politically. And so they started to uh, demand and, 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 and voice demands and, and for better education, et cetera, et cetera. So what was interesting by not recognizing them and also that people were congregating in, in a sort of similar space, they could voice their own uh, demands and their, their, they, they created their own political voice against the local authorities, which is quite unusual in, in that Mexican context. So, um, and, and the migrant shelters have been important in this respect. Now we are a few years later, and what we also see is now that there are a lot of people from Central America 
who are trying to cross the border with the United States, but increasingly that has also become very duff, difficult under Trump and so on. So what you're seeing is now that Monterrey has become a, a destination for uh, Central American migrants. And from being migrants in transit and, and trying to cross into the United States, what we also see is that Monterrey is one of those places where, um, where, where migrants have tried to, uh, to, to find a, a new, uh, new beginning, let's put it that way. Okay, um, just to finish up, sorry that I'm a little um, over time. Um, basically, what we're trying to do with this, this work is to show that, is, um, <clears throat> that there is a certain quote unquote messiness, right? In terms of uh, urban migrant assemblages, um, because a lot of the literature, and I'm not sure if you've talked about this, but a lot of the urban literature talks about uh, assemblages and, and how these are being uh, generated. And, but if you look at urban migrant uh, assemblages, they're, they're not very stable. They're, they're uh, constructed, reconstructed. They, the, there's, there's a lot of fluidity there. Um, the other thing is that some of those uh, assemblages that have uh, been created over time, such as the German expats in Puebla, they're almost invisibilized as, uh, as assemblages, but also as, um, as migrant assemblages. Again, because they're considered expats, not migrants. So from, and, and this is just one of those issues that I'm, I'm trying to, to think about um, is, okay, especially in a context in, in the global South, in Latin America, and, and, and when you're going to deal with these issues, uh, undoubtedly you will also deal uh, with, with some of these, these concerns. There's a lot of um, insecurity, obviously, especially uh, in, not only in urban areas, but in urban areas, it, it, it becomes more visible. And so how do migrant assemblages overlap or inter intersect with those insecurities or discursively because often then you know the, the the people who generate these insecurities are are the outsiders are the foreigners etc cetera, etc cetera. how does it overlap with uh, trying to become more competitive you know in 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 the context of globalization and what are the implications so if we look at migrant assemblages, what are the connections and connectivities with these other assemblages? And then finally, in terms of governance, um, I think it is important to, to uh, recognize the role of cities in migration governance, right? Um, and, and to take as a starting point that migrants are important in terms of redevelopment, competitiveness, uh, but also how cities shape these experience of migrants. And we need to go beyond that. We really need to understand what those connections are. And if we look at, well, now I'm, I'm obviously, again, I'm, I'm, I've been looking at, at uh, Mexico in particular through this uh, research project, but with a change of government that we've had um, a few years back in 2018 with uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, what we're seeing is that a lot of what had already been done has been completely um, eliminated, right? The, on the agenda of the federal government, migrants do not really figure very clearly, which means it's sort of coming down to the local level and suddenly there's not so much attention to migrants and migration. And what we see as a result also is that with Trump and um, in, in the United States, with these migrant caravans that we've had coming through, there's been an increasing um, uh, securitization and militarization of uh, migration policies, uh, trying to stop migrants at the Southern border of Mexico which has created a lot of uh, tensions and, 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 and issues. 
And now one of those Southern towns that I already mentioned before, Tapachula, has been called a carceral city because migrants who've crossed the border and are supposed to, to apply for a humanitarian visa in order to be able to cross Mexico, they're not allowed out of the city. The, the National Guard and the military have just put a, a cordon around them, uh, around the city, so they cannot leave the city. So we now have what is called a carceral city at Mexico's southern border. So what, for me, what we're seeing is in, in, in uh, just a few years time, you see a complete um, falling apart of a certain kind of institutionalization and institutional practices around some issues, in this particular case, uh, migratory policies. And, and which also then, uh, you know, makes me wonder what will happen with when the next, you know, elections are and the next president comes in. But that is a few years from now. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope um, it was a little bit informative and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions or doubts or whatever you have. Yeah. Okay, well, the, the book, I'm not sure if you had access to the book, actually talks about three cities. Basically, they're, they're trying to use this framework for those three cities. But obviously, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't uh, use the, um, you know, the, the entire book. So, so that's why I just uh, uh, had you read the, the introduction. But I would really recommend to look at the rest of the book. Um, because it is very interesting, especially because they're not, you know, sort of very well-known cities, uh, you know, that, that receive a lot of attention. The other place where you could look at, um, there is the, um, let me, it's the, the it's a website, um, it's, it's Globalization and, and, uh, and World Cities. Um, it's done by a group of geographers in, um, in, in, in the United, United Kingdom and the University of Loughborough. And they do a lot of research on different cities. And they talk about the, probably not exactly this particular part, but um, I would say that uh, at least with the information that they provide, you can, you can sort of get some of this, this, this information. And there is, in general, um, there has been a lot of um, research done on the spatial reorganizations of, of cities um, in terms of migrants and gentrification. And so that, that usually means um, is a sort of a, a way in which you can identify which groups of citizens or people living there, right, have access to power and, and can sort of help uh, contribute to this and those who have been marginalized. So that's where the inequalities and the dispossession come in. Uh, oh, that's always such a hard question. Um, look, I'm, I'm originally Dutch. Uh, right now I'm actually in Amsterdam. Um, and, and it's always the same story here in the Netherlands. Like, right, we're already so overpopulated. We don't have any uh, houses for uh, local people or, or uh, you know, uh, or even rooms. So what are we going to do? We cannot have more people. It's always the same story. And, um, but then what is so, so curious is, you know, the refugees from Syria were seen as the outsiders and had to be, um, you know, uh, they had to be attended uh, regionally. So in Turkey, in, in Jordan, in Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now it's from the Ukraine, so, the, the regional response should be 
also here in Europe, but I already start hearing people saying, well, you know, yes, they can come a little while, but not, not forever because, uh, well, the first reaction was, well, they're, they're very much like us, right? Which already keep, makes me sort of very, <laughs> very um, suspicious, let's put it that way. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Are they all, you know, uh, Christian? Are they all, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then immediately after that, well, but at the same time, they cannot come here, all of them, because uh, we're so overpopulated, right? So it's, it's immediately, it's the same kind of, um, of discourse, it's it's it has changed a little bit because they're from the Ukraine, uh, but then they say, well, you know, they have to be um, they have to be received regionally. Yes, but we are in that region, so then we do have to <laughs> receive them according to EU and Dutch policies, right? Um, I think for now it's still okay and people see the the problem more as in terms of uh, people who've asked previously for uh, um, asylum and have not gotten it or still in the process so they're they're sort of um, uh, uh, clogging up the system you know this is the way that people <laughs> they talk about people um, and then they're saying, well, maybe once uh, the, the backlog is done, then we can deal with people from the Ukraine. But it, it, is, it is very, very, very complicated. It's the, 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 the xenophobic kind of reactions are, are, are incredible. Now, I have a colleague um, in, in Nijmegen, which is right uh, near the German border. And... One of the things that he did in, in, precisely with the refugees from Syria was to create what he called a refugee university. So he had refugees teaching local people about you know, what is going on, but also other, other issues. And that, that worked quite well. So I, that was quite an interesting, um, an interesting kind of you know, initiative, but then, and in the end, the, the university said, well, you probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. So it was like, okay. So even there, there is a lot of, you know, tension about because he was using the installations of the university and, you know, couldn't do that. So I, I have a lot of problems with, with uh, that, that particular discourse. And I find it very difficult. I mean, you know, you talk with people and you try to show them, you know, this is this is something people are people, you know, they're human beings, you know, we shouldn't be thinking in all these uh, different categories. But but it's it's you're it's very difficult to convince people. It's it's <laughs> it's a little bit the dialogue of the deaf, unfortunately. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's a very complex uh, issue, and, and thank you for for sharing this this with me. Um, first of all, um, what 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 we saw in the past was that, uh, in particular, Central American migrants were migrants in transit. So so um, authorities, either federal or local authorities, were not very concerned about them because they would be going to the northern border and they would try to cross. So they, they were not seen as a burden. And so usually, you know, with exceptions, and there were, sometimes there were, uh, um, you know, there, there, there were sort of uh, uh, attempts to, to, to slow down the, the flow of, of migrants, and in particular when the United States would put more pressure on, on Mexican authorities to stop uh, migratory flows from the south. What happened was that, um, and, and in particular, um, 
two presidents down. <laughs> no, sorry, so what I'm saying, one president down, uh, uh, Peña Nieto, Enrique Peña Nieto, he started um, to increase the, um, the, 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 or at least his government started to, to put uh, stricter rules and regulations and more control on the southern border. Right, which made it more difficult for migrants to cross and to also get to the United States. And so, what they then did, um, and but but also at the same time, um, so that that increased on that side from the authorities the insecurity of of migrants. But at the same time, the, also the cartels um, started to um, become much more active because. You know, uh, in terms of income, one of the the big industries is uh, um, the smuggling of people, and 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 also um, what they would call trata de personas, right? Is so trafficking in people, so smuggling and trafficking. So they become became involved, right? So um, when you when you would try to cross. Uh, you know, the, the area around the northern border of Mexico with the United States, increasingly the, the, the smugglers had to pay to the cartels in order to cross that part, right? They had to pay piso, okay? And so what you see then is that the insecurities for, for migrants became very, very, uh, very high. And so what migrants with the help of some organizations did was to start to organize these uh, caravanas, the caravans, the migrant caravans, which started in 2018. And with that, um, they said, well, there is a security in numbers. So they started with a couple of thousand people walking through and then what some local uh, towns would do or, or, or um, even uh, state governments, they would actually give them rides on, on trucks and buses and I don't know what to the next town. Because it's like, okay, well then at least they're gone. I mean, this was a sort of <laughs> displacing the problem a little bit, but you know, so that, that happened in 2018 and 2019. But in the summer of 2019, uh, the Trump government said, well, um, if you're going to continue with this and provide humanitarian visas, et cetera, et cetera, um, then, um, you know, if you don't do anything, we will increase uh, the, um, you know, the, 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 the taxes, the import taxes for your products to the United States. And, and every time you know, every month that you uh, don't do anything, it's 10% or 5%, I, I forgot, more. So what you see then is there is a turn, a, a change in, in, um, in the government uh, at, at, the, at the federal level, and they start to really, you know, start to close down the southern border. And which obviously, if you have a group of people like, uh, 5,000 people in a, in, a, in a big group, it's easy to find them, right? Before there were smaller little groups and so it was more difficult to find them. But if they come in, in these multitudes, it's very easy to say, okay, stop here. That's when you see an increased, um, what they call securitization or militarization, whatever term you prefer, of the migratory policies. And they start to stop people from going through. So now people are going back to the uh, moving in small in small groups because they're more difficult to, to catch. With all of that, with the increased insecurity of migrants and the, and the stepping up of uh, migration policy, uh, the, the mi mi migratory policies by the federal government in terms of more control and so on, what you're seeing is that um, <clears throat> it, 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 it also, um, how can I say this, feeds into a sort of a discourse of saying, well, you know, um, they, they, they're they invading us. They, they're, they're also then by the local population are seen as, uh, as a security threat, right? Because we need the army, we need the National Guard to stop them. And 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 I think that in the case of, of for instance, um, 
what I saw in, in 2018 and so on in, in Puebla was, for instance, there was a lot of collaboration between civil society organizations and the local government in order to deal with these caravanas and, and migrants. And that for, for a lot of people from the civil society organizations, this was something new. But now it has completely uh, changed 180 degrees. So now they're sort of opposite. The, 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 the local authorities are, are trying to complicate uh, the issues for these, these migrant shelters. They're, they're trying to raid them. Um, they're, they're really op uh, trying to prevent people from moving on. And so what you see is, is really a, a much more antagonistic kind of relationship between local authorities and um, and the uh, and 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 you know migrant the people who are the defending uh, the rights of migrants. So that is going on. That's the general picture. With COVID, there were actually very few people coming through. Uh, one because they were stopped in Central America um, by the Guatemalan authorities in particular, but also because the shelters closed down in Mexico closed down they wouldn't they they were so afraid for COVID they wouldn't accept people right and all the shelters I think with the exception of one all the shelters in Mexico are in the hands of uh, civil society organizations in particular church organizations the Catholic Church right so the they nobody really came through there, there was a sort of uh stop but after, you know, now that COVID has gone down a little bit, well, and up, <laughs> but, but at the same time with uh, Biden in office and saying that he was going to get rid of the remain in Mexico policy where uh, people who were asking for asylum uh, had to stay in Mexico before they would even be attended and, and, and get some kind of court hearing in the United States. He wanted to get rid of that last year. And that is when you see, again, um, the, 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 the amount of people moving through increase, but not anymore in the big caravanas, because that's when you, what you're seeing is what is happening in, in Tapachula. Uh, as I said, Tapachula now in the literature is called a carceral city. They, they, they're keeping, I mean, I there I would say with for the local population it's it it must be very difficult because they have people living in the streets everywhere nobody knows what to do how to do I mean nobody can go anywhere and 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 migrants are who are stuck there they obviously also get more and more angry and they're saying you know we also have a right etc cetera, etc cetera. we're we're still human beings and uh, you cannot just keep us here because they don't even have, you know, they don't get any money, they, any support whatsoever. Local organization cannot deal with it. So that, that is very difficult. I mean, it's, I don't know, uh, I would have to look up the, the amounts, but it's in, in the thousands of people who are living in the streets, right? So, so that, that there is an issue there and that the local people are saying, you know, what are we going to do? I understand that because it's really right there in your face and there, there's no attempt by the authorities to, to, to really deal with the issue and try to disperse and, 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 and say, okay, you can go here, you can go there and in, in a more, you know, orderly manner. In the case of Monterrey, I would say it's more, um, well, in a certain way, it's, it, the issue is not as, as big as it is in the southern part of the country. But at the same time, um, I know that, for instance, um, the last government with, with the Bronco, El Bronco, right? They, they just closed down the migratory office, right? So they don't even want to deal with the issue. So I think a, a big issue here is lack of attention by local government because there are ways in which you can deal with this. And, 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 and also many uh, migrants, they, they are willing to 
you know, they, 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 even if they want to go to the U.S., they, they do need to work, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think usually, I mean, this is always the general discussion. Usually migrants don't take the jobs of local people because there are jobs that local people don't want to do anymore, right? That is, in many cases, is already the issue. But there are so many jobs that need to be done, right? Um, and, 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 and where, where people can uh, be accommodated or, uh, you know, the, the little, you know, stalls with, with uh, selling some food and things like that, which you see everywhere in, in, in the global south and also in, in Mexico. There, there are ways in which you can also say to people, okay, we cannot support you, but you can start your own little, you know, quote unquote business. I do think there are ways out of this problem. And I think it's more uh, the local authorities who do not want to deal with the issue than that it is that um, migrants are really taking away the jobs of local people. I think it, it has more to do with that, but um, that, that is my own uh, interpretation of this. But thank you for the question. Yeah, a very, very interesting question. Um, and um, if you would have asked me this question, um, well, three, four years ago, I would have said, no, they're, they're on track of, of engaging more in, uh, you know, in, 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 in sort of uh, dealing with, with global governance issues. Um, because the, there were initiatives at, uh, in these different cities, for instance, in Puebla, there were a lot of, um, Issues for they they always had a, a they're part of the the framework and a network for uh, smart cities and they, they were doing all sorts of things. What I'm seeing is that there has been a very significant turn with what is called in Mexico the the the, the fourth transition the cuatro T with uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Uh, in the sense that I see an increased centralization, that more and more is uh, power, literally, is being uh, is 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 being uh, shifted toward the central or federal government, and 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 also I'm I'm not a, a specialist in local government, but what I know from you know my indirect way of, of dealing with this is that that funding for cities uh, comes from the federal government. They're, they're very, there's very little locally based funding, right? So for the central government, it's very easy to, to take away power from these cities, right? And I think that is what is exactly happening now. So, and then there, since there's less power at the local level, you also have fewer people who are interested in uh, becoming the mayor of, uh, of, of a city, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a sort of um, a vicious circle almost, uh, you know, because there's less power, you have also people who are not so interested in, in expanding and, and engaging in, in uh, global governance but more in, in local issues. And, and, and so um, un, un, unless that, that structure, that funding structure, and um, there is a real decentralization or, uh, in terms of, of the federal system, I think it will, will be very difficult for these, these towns, which were doing some, some interesting stuff, um, but really, um, really gaining the power to, to become very significant in, in these global governance issues. For instance, uh, civil society um, in Tijuana, from the, of the three cities that we looked at, is very strong and has a lot of context, obviously, with uh, uh, organizations in, in California and San Diego and so on. 
Um, in the case of Puebla, and to some extent also in Monterrey, um, they're not so strong. I mean, they're, they're really, they're underfunded, but also under equipped in terms of people working there. And, and although you would expect the opposite, um, with, with uh, the current government, um, at, in particular at the federal and state level, um, there has been uh, very little uh, incentive. Actually, the, there have passed some, some legislation that makes it more difficult for civil society organizations to get funding. So, and, and, and uh, I mean, that really makes it even more difficult. And some organizations that had some funding, but also international funding, in particular, obviously from the United States, were immediately branded as uh, traitors. And well, I don't need to add the rest, I'm, I'm assuming. So it is. it has been very, very complicated right now. It, some people say we just have to wait till 2024 and then, you know, with a new government, uh, things may change. So that is what some people are, are saying. Yeah, so two more years. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, good luck with the rest of the course. And if there are any questions that people want to ask me, just forward them uh, to my email and I'll be happy to, to attend them. So no, no, no problem whatsoever. And it was wonderful to, uh, to get some, some feedback. <laughs>